Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's begin our service tonight. Let's all stand to our feet in this place. We're going we're gonna to go into a time of prayer as we begin our service tonight. We've got a lot of people that we need to pray for. We need to lift up Brother Donnie especially, lift up Brother Shannon and Sister Stacy. They're not feeling well tonight. And I know there's many others. But tonight I want us to go to, for just a moment, to Matthew 7, 7 through 8. And it says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. And tonight as we go into this time of prayer, I just want to ask and, and just declare that a spirit of liberty is going to fall into this place tonight because I know that there are people in this place that need answers and they're asking God which way that they need to go. And we have people that are seeking for the, the direction that they need to take in their life. And we have people that are knocking for opportunity, waiting on those doors to open up. And I just want to ask us tonight if we would just step out in faith for just a little bit tonight, if we could just have a time of prayer in this place, if you would just lift your hands to heaven tonight and just seek after God for a little bit. I know we all have needs, we have desires in our hearts, and we have things that we really need God to move on in our lives. So, Lord, we just want to thank you for just being able to be here first of all tonight, Lord. Just want to thank you for everyone that's here, God. Just pray that, that tonight, Lord, that we could just get your attention for a little while, Lord. God, I just pray that you will hear us tonight. Lord, there's so many needs in the house tonight. Lord, there's so, so much sickness that's going on right now. People not feeling well. People who have just things, Lord, that only you can take care of, God. And I just want to pray that, that you would just have your way in this place tonight. And thank you, God, for everything that you do. Lord, we just want to lift you up tonight. And we just want to dwell with you in this place. God, we just want to be in your presence tonight. And thank you, Lord, for everything. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
How good has he been to you, church? How many miracles has he performed in your life? How many times has he came through for you? How many times has he delivered you out of trouble when you got yourself in a mess? You just can't explain it. It only has to be God. Whenever you find yourself in a situation and you find your way coming through it out on the other side, it can only be God sometimes. We think about how great that he's been to us. Think about how we could give back to him, what we could give back to him tonight. We're going to have a time of giving. We've got many ways that we can give here, and they're all on the screen. If we could get this declaration of faith up on the board, and we could pray it together with faith tonight. Would you seek after God with me tonight and pray over this offering? Upon the authority of your word, I have, I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings, and I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, the curse is broken, I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received, my whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in and I am blessed going out and all that I do will prosper. In Jesus' name, amen. So come and give, church. Yeah. 
Praise the Lord, everybody. We could have Riverbend Kids and Riverbend Ignited come on up to the front. Have everyone come up tonight at the same time. If everybody would, let's just stretch a hand towards all these young people up here and let's just pray over them tonight. Lord, we just want to ask tonight that you would help us be able to teach, Lord, that you would help us be able to grow and to learn. God, I pray that you'll help us build a foundation, Lord, of your love and of the knowledge. Lord, I, I just pray that we could fall in love with your word. I just pray, God, that you would just help us to be able to, to just get stronger in your word and your love, God. And I pray that you would guide us in everything that we do. Lord, I just want to thank you for everyone that's here tonight. I just pray that we can have a great class tonight. And I just want to ask that you would please just anoint the teachers, that you would anoint the word, that you would anoint the lessons that we're going to have tonight. We just thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Go on back, angel. Go, go on back. Lottie, go back to the class. Right, and everybody else, we're going to stay out here. Brother David's going to come minister to us tonight. I don't know how many people has heard him teach in a while, but I wish that I knew the word half as good as what this man here does. He, he is a teacher. He knows the word, and I love to hear him. I can't wait to go back and watch it. Thank you, Brother Richard. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Amen, amen. How many of you glad to be here tonight? Amen. I am glad to be here tonight. I've got a simple subject tonight, if you will, but it's one that the Lord laid on my heart, and it kind of falls in line with what Brother Larry taught to us Sunday morning. And uh, I want to talk to you for a little bit tonight about my relationship to the Creator. My relationship to the Creator. And I shared part of this with you Sunday morning, but I felt like we're going to share it again tonight. Uh, Hebrews 11 and 1, a very familiar passage of Scripture. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, and it is the evidence of things not seen. Everything that I do in living for God is based on my faith in Him. Can I say that again? Everything that I do in living for God Everything that I go through, Brother Terrence, everything that I have to endure, everything that I have to face is based on my faith in God. Our faith it gives us the ability to see spiritually, and everyone has been given a measure of faith according to Romans 12 and 3. We've all been dealt a measure of faith. It's just what we do with it that counts. And I've always explained it like this when I talk about faith. Faith is like a muscle. The more you exercise it, the more that it grows. The more that I put my trust and my faith in God, the bigger that it will grow in Him. Faith consists in believing when it is beyond the power of reason to believe. When everything else says it's not going to happen, when everything else says there's no way that that's going to take place, Brother Chris, my faith steps in and says, it'll be okay. It'll be, it'll be okay. To one who has faith, no explanation is necessary. If I've got faith, you don't have to tell me anything else because I know that God is going to take care of the situation that I find myself in. And to one without faith, no explanation is possible. It takes faith to believe that God is able to be where we cannot be and able to do what we can't. And the success of our faith is not only in the beginning, but in continuing, steadfast and unmovable. That's my faith in God. Not let anything sway it. My faith is built upon and it grows as I hear and do what the Word of God tells me to do. The lack of perseverance in people's life is often the number one reason for defeat. Romans 10 and 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God, Brother Terrence, what I, what I hear, 
what the pastor preaches, what I apply to my heart. That's where my faith comes from, from his word. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Yet some people, and I include myself in some of these, okay? I'm not throwing stones. It's at me. I've always said that whatever the Lord gives me deals with me first. But Larry, he comes back at me first because he's talking to me. Yet some people don't listen or refuse to hear. They shut out everything that's spoken from this platform. They shut it out because they don't want to hear it. They don't, they don't want to hear it. Some of them listen, but they don't understand. There's some that hear and understand, but they don't believe it. But there is some that hear, they understand, and they believe, and then they do it, and their faith grows as it applies in their life. The only way we're ever going to see God win the battle is to stay in the battle. We've got to stay in the fight and never surrender. There will always be two sides to the battle of life. There's going to be the fight side or there's going to be the flight side. And we always need to choose fight over flight. The battle of life is heaven or hell. And it's our responsibility to avoid hell because God has made heaven available to all of us. Every one of us. Leonardo da Vinci was born in 1452, and he was a, a, an accomplished scientist. He was a mathematician. He was an engineer. He was an inventor. He was a painter, a sculptor, an architect, a botanist, a musician, and, an, and a writer. And at the heart of his work, or his body of work, lies a concept that da Vinci simply called Sefer Videri. And it means knowing how to see or seeing how seeing is believing. Knowing how to see or seeing is believing. He thought sight was mankind's greatest and most important sense. Our eyes are the mirror to our soul. Brother, brother, brother Gio preached this sermon a, a, a long time ago, but he talked about the lust of the eye and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. These are avenues which the enemy gains access to our soul, and it's through our eyes, the things that we see. And the things that we take in. And Da Vinci believed that our eyes were the most important organ. And he stressed the importance of knowing how to see. He believed in the accumulation of direct knowledge and facts through the observation or sight by what we see. Or what we're looking at. Or what we take in. The Mona Lisa and the Last, Last Supper are two of the most famous works that he ever painted. And within each of them are details that are not often seen because of our focus on the paintings themselves. The Mona Lisa was a portrait of Lisa Gherardini del Giannando. She was a wealthy silk merchant's wife and the mother of five children. And an art historian identified her as the woman within the picture of the painting. The 2005 discovery of a 500-year-old note by an acquaintance of da Vinci confirmed the theory for many scholars it is thought that the Florentine beauty's husband commissioned the work to celebrate her upcoming birth of her child. And indeed, some have chalked up the subject's enigmatic expression in loose garments to pregnancy. For reasons that remain unclear, Da Vinci never gave the Mona Lisa to the Giacondo family. People often focus on her smile, or they often focus on on her eyes, but they often miss, and this is blowed up, but they often miss the blue water in the background. They often miss the snowy peaks in the background. There's an image of a bridge down here at the bottom. We don't see the details because we get lost in the big picture. We don't see what's taking place because I'm lost in her face. And I don't see all the details that are going on in the background. The Last Supper depicts the chaos of disciples after Jesus had told them that one of them would betray him. And on the table is a spill shaker of salt. And some say it may be at Judas's elbow, if you will. It's there on the table right here. But we get lost in the big picture of what's going on around it, and we, get, we, we, we lose the details of what's happening. I'm talking about learning to understand that there is more to living for God than what we really want to see. God wants us to have an intimate relationship with us and we are willing and ready. But are we focused on the chaos of life? 
think about where you're at tonight. Think about what's going on in your life. And I know, I know everybody's got troubles. Everybody's got problems. If you don't, come talk to me. Tell me, tell me how you don't. Let me, let me know. You know, the Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. It happens to all. And I'll read a scripture later to prove that. But are, are we so focused on the chaos of life that we're losing out on what God's really trying to do to us and do in us and do for us? I know at times that I do. I, I, I lose that thought. I lose that. And I'm focused on the chaos that's going on in my life. And I'm focused on the problems that's going on at work and, and the things that are happening. And, and I let it get me down. And I let it get me depressed. Hey, I'm just speaking honestly with you now. Like I said, this is for me first. But God wanted me to share it. The Vinci said there were three classes of people. The people that see, those who see when they are shown. Some of us might not have ever seen the details in that picture unless it was pointed out. And those who don't see. And those are the ones that are, are in trouble. The Bible tells us that we walk by faith and not by sight. But sometimes... And I'm speaking for myself. Sometimes I let my natural vision get in the way of my spiritual vision. And when I do, it's hard for me to see what God's trying to do in my life. I get overwhelmed by the big picture, if you will. My natural vision overpowers my spiritual vision. I see too many reasons why I won't work. I see distractions and I can't stay focused. Because my natural vision is clouding my spiritual vision. I'm letting the natural man get in the way of the spiritual man. I think about Peter walking on the water. And the Bible says that Peter stepped out. The Lord bid him to come and he stepped out. Sister Stephanie, he began to walk on the water. Defied, defied nature. He began to walk on the water. But all of a sudden, he lost his focus. He began to focus on what's going on around him. He began to focus on the storm that was happening. And the Lord said, we're going to go to the other side. We're going to get there and go to, go to the other side. But there's some things that's going to have to happen while you're in the middle of it. And Peter stepped out and walked. That was faith because God said, come. But then somewhere in the middle of it, and we can, we can so relate to that. I can so relate to that. In the middle of that, walking on the water, he began to see the chaos around him. He began to see the storm. He began to see the waves rolling up. The Sea of Galilee, if you understand it, and if you study that, there were, there were, where there were winds that kind of come down and they would blow right across it and it would disrupt that lake as they were going across it and he faced that storm. And so many times in my life, that's happened to me. Maybe sometimes we see God like this. God is described as omnipotent. He's all-powerful. Nothing is too hard for him to do. His word is never devoid of power. So when he speaks, everything in creation obeys him. And I think the best definition of omnipotence is that he has complete and total control over everything. But yet, there are some times that he will just step back. It's not that he's taking his hand off of it, but sometimes he's just going to step back and kind of see how we deal with it and how we handle it. He's always there to hear us when we call upon him, but sometimes he wants to see how we're going to react to the situation. He's omniscient. He knows everything, and everything he does has an intelligent purpose. It has a, a definite goal. He knows us where we are in whatever situation we find ourselves in. He sees us, and he knows what we're feeling. He's omnipresent. His presence is in every place and time. From creation, there has never been a time or place that God wasn't there. Think, think, think about that. Yeah. Psalms 139 indicates that God is present everywhere. David said, where can I go to escape your presence? If I ascend up in the heavens, I'm going to find you there. If I make my bed in hell, I'll find you there. There's no place that I can go, that you are not going to be there. Big picture, all-powerful, all-knowing. He knows everything. But often I ask myself, Brother Blake, is he concerned about me? Is the Lord concerned about me? I know that he is. And I know as hard as this, this seems, there's some people that are dealing with some 
true battles. You're dealing with some true trials in your life. You're dealing with some sickness in your life, whether you're here or you're watching online. But I feel like I need to let someone know tonight that God sees right where you are. And as hard as it is to understand, you are right where he wants you and where he needs you at at this moment. That's not always easy to accept, Brother Ronnie. But Larry, I, talked, I thought about as you talked Sunday morning as you preached your message, such a, such a powerful message. In, in, in our carnal way of thinking, in our natural way of thinking, and I, you said this yourself, you're sitting there on a bar stool. And God's speaking to you. And I know some of it might find it hard to believe, but God had you right where he wanted you at. Even though it's where you shouldn't have been. But it was there at that moment. It was there at that place. It was there at that time that he said, I can talk to Larry Bobo right there. I get Larry Bobo's attention and, 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 and get him to listen to what I've got to say to him. To draw him where I need to draw him. I never want to look at anyone's situation because I may have never been in your shoes. I may have never been where you're at. But I got to believe by faith that everything's going to be all right. God's going to take care of every situation that we're in. Sometimes the outcome not, might not be what we want to be, but God is still in control of everything. He's still in control of everything and every situation. Brother Larry's message alone with shattered things. He spoke about Moses. And Sister Kim Haney wrote in the Pentecostal Life in November of 2023 that Moses' sincere but emotional choice when he killed the Egyptian, removed him from a life of luxury and limelight, and brought him to a desert where he was common and unknown. You know, he was Pharaoh's son while he was in the palace. But when he was on the backside of the desert tending to his father-in-law's seat, there wasn't nobody knowed him. He didn't even own the seat that he tended to. They were his father-in-laws. But Moses responded to God by his next choice. He chose to be content in a barren season that he was in. The scripture said that he was content to dwell with man. A barren season is where nothing's happening, Sister Leanne. There's nothing taking place. There's nothing being birthed. There's nothing being born. And he was in a barren season in, his, in, in, in where he was at, on the backside of the desert. But Larry talked about it Sunday morning. But he's there. And nobody knows who he is. Do you ever feel that way sometimes? God knows where we're at. God sees where we're at. Paul spoke in Philippians 4.11 and Brother, Brother Gio talked about it. He talked about being content in whatever situation that he found himself in. Whether he was happy, whether he was sad, whether he was full and had plenty to eat or whether he was hungry. Whatever situation. Now that, that's hard to say in our natural way of thinking. It's so hard to say that I'm going to be happy but I'm hungry. I'm so I, I'm going to be okay and I'm going to be content at where I'm at, even though I'm sad. Life has dealt me a blow that I don't know how to handle. Life has given me something that I don't know what to do with. There's heartache and there's pain. But Paul said, I'm going to be content in whatever situation I find myself in. Because God's in control. Because God's in control. He, he learned that a long time ago. God watches how we respond when we feel invisible, when there's no pulpit or no accolades. We feel we've been placed on the top shelf and everyone is passing us by. But we have a choice to be content and embrace the season of being hidden. It's a place of God where God tests us. He tests what we are made of. The fact that Moses chose to be content in God's stripping season speaks more powerfully than the parting of the Red Sea. He was content to be right where God had put him at. And it was more powerful than him parting the Red Sea. He didn't part the Red Sea. We know God parted the Red Sea. It was in this desert season that God was building a ministry, not just a man. That fortitude that he gained 
while he was out there on the backside of that desert, helped him lead the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. You see, God was building something in him. God was doing a work in his life. God was making something out of Moses, even though Moses probably couldn't see it. So ask yourself tonight, what is God trying to do in my life? Where's God trying to lead me to? What does God want to do through me? The situation that I found myself in, it's not where I wanted to be, but God has brought me here for a reason. God has brought me here for a purpose. Dr. Victor Frankel, a survivor of the Holocaust, had every bit of his dignity stripped from him. Yet everything he faced, he penned these words. Everything can be taken from a man but one thing. The last human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances is to choose one's own way. They can't strip my decision of where I'm at. I choose how I respond to my situation and I don't always make the right choice sometimes. Speaking for myself, Brother Jeff Harpo wrote in a blog, he said, the season, of, the season is upon us but not the season we're thinking about. There's a season of well-doing which does not produce a crop. The Bible presents the need for us to continue in times of want and implore us to work, to pray, to fast, to give, and to serve when there's no evidence of a harvest. The seasons of planting or waiting are always more critical than a harvest of reaping. And I wrote, on the, uh, a note on the other side of that as I read that, if we don't get the seeds in the ground, there never will be a harvest. If we don't plant some seeds along the way, if we don't sow something along the way, and no matter what journey I find myself in, no matter what situation I find myself, I've got to be planting something. I've got to be putting something in the ground because there's, no, there's not going to be a harvest if the seed never makes it in the ground. The heart of the faithful is challenged when right things are done, but the result is not evident. Everyone desires their due season, but a few want to discuss the ones which precede it. We want, we want that harvest. We want that harvest that takes place, that, that, uh, that abundant season. But there's some hardship that goes through that. We're fixing to enter. I worked for John Deere. I've worked for John Deere for 30 plus years. And I've seen many seasons, Brother Cody. I've seen many things happen. We're coming up on another planting season. And I will tell you that as you get older, it seems like everything gets faster and faster and faster. It passes so fast, but I've seen it where it's rained in the spring and the farmers had a hard time getting seed in the ground. They've had a hard time getting what they wanted to plant in the ground. They, most of them have always had a crop, Brother Richard, but not always what they wanted. Because of the season that they were in. There's some hardships that we face in the seasons that we walk in. But as long as we're trying to plant, as long as we're trying to put something in the ground, we're going to reap a harvest. Seasons change, but I wonder if they are contingent upon how I treat them. It could be that goodness of God is keeping me in my season so I can learn to rejoice in it. Trust is rarely found in the harvest. And growth is not always an upward movement. The process of growth entails pruning and cutting back. John chapter 15 speaks about the parable of the true vine. There's some pruning. There's some weeding that takes place. There's some things that happen that we have to do along the way. We have to be pruned and we have to be trimmed before growth can take place. Trust is rarely found in a harvest and growth is not always an upward movement. Paul and Silas were singing at midnight bound in a Roman jail. It did make sense. It may have looked like the end, but they were showing us what it means to faint not in well-doing. The season we are in may not, must not limit our faith or our work. If we continue, a new season will come. Now, the Bible tells us that God does care about us. He said, Psalms 139, 13 through 15, it says, You have made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion and as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. 
1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 says, You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Which in times past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which have not attained mercy, but now has obtained mercy. I wrote this down as I, I, I've got some men here that I'm going to talk about, but I, I wrote this down and I, I put down, where do me or we hide when we run from God? Where do we hide when we run from God? I don't know if there's ever been a circumstance in your life where you ran from God, but there has been in mine. Went through a few things, probably of about 16, I guess. I got to church, got the Holy Ghost when I was 12. and uh, Me and my girlfriend broke up. Show you how stupid I was. Told mom, I said, I'm not going back to church. I don't care. You're not going to make me go back to church. You're not going back to church. And uh, she didn't say anything. It really surprised me because my mom's pretty strict. I've always been pretty strict. You know, she raised me and pretty strict. And I... I pretty well, whatever mom told me, I did. And uh, she said, okay. And uh, they went a few few services. I didn't go to church. And I was working. I worked at uh, Pennhurst at that time. It was what it was before it became the dollar store. And I was working at night. I had to close that night. And, man, it was just something hit me. I mean, I just, right there in the store, I just began to weep and cry. And it was God dealing with me. Brother Larry, where I was at, you know, I'd made my mind up. I'm big. I'm a big boy. I'm not going back. I just, I'm through with it. I'm finished with it. And there, right there in the middle of the store, the girl that I worked with, she was lo looking at me, and I said, I got to go to church. We were in revival. I said, when he closed these doors, oh, David's going to church. I made a beeline in the door. They were having church. They were singing, and I ran to the altar. God was still right, reaching for me. It was it, it was that season, but I had ran away from him. But when I realized where I needed to go, I ran back to him. I ran back to him. Psalm 61, 1 through 4 says, Hear my cry, O God, and attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth I will cry to you when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from mine enemy. And I will abide in your tabernacle forever, and I will trust in the shelter of your wings. Psalms 144, 1 and 2 says, Blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle, my loving kindness in my fortress, my high tower, and my deliverer, my shield, and the one whom I take refuge, which subdues my people under me. And Proverbs 18 and 10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run into and are safe. You may be like Abraham, which was called to leave his family and his home. And the Bible says in Hebrews 11, he obeyed, called to do what God chose him to do, that he would receive an inheritance. And he went not knowing where he was going to go. He had no idea what God was going to do in his life. All he had was trust in God and his faith in God. You may be like Gideon. Who was afraid. He was hiding in the wine press, threshing wheat. And an angel appeared unto him and told him, Gideon, the Lord is with you, thou mighty man of valor. Gideon's response was, well, if that's so, why has all this happened to me? Why has all this taken place? Why has all this befallen me and my family? Where are the miracles which our fathers told us about? Why has he forsaken us? My family is poor and I'm the least in my father's house. Why, Lord, why, 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 why has this happened? Jonah called to preach a message of God's forgiveness to his greatest enemy. He was called to the nation of, uh, of Nineveh, 120,000 Assyrian people that were warriors, that were mean, that had, that had defiled his family. And God says, I want you to go preach a message of repentance to these people. When you, when you study that and you read that, Jonah ran from the presence of the Lord 
The Bible says it also about Cain. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. They ran from God, if you will. We know the story with Jonah. God got a hold of him in the belly of the whale or the belly of a fish. He swallowed by a great fish, spit out. Jonah went and preached to Nineveh, had a great revival. They all repented. He was still mad about it. He still wasn't happy about it. But God called him to do it, but he ran. Perhaps you're like Jeremiah. He was chosen by God in his mother's belly. He said, I got to work for you. Jeremiah, 40 years, preached the message of God through the reign of five kings. You know how many people he's seen saved? None. None. Elijah, running from Jezebel, hiding in a cave. And God speaks to him in a still, small voice. What are you doing here? What are you, what are you doing here? You know, everybody's dead, everybody's killed. He said, no, I've got 700 prophets of Baal. I've got, I've got this and that. The Lord had to talk to him in a still, small voice. I think about Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego, living in a foreign land, living under a, 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 a king that told them what to do. But they lived for God, and they stayed faithful. They were true to God. But yet, they went through the lines then. They went through the fiery furnace. But you know what? God was there every, every step of the way. God was there with them. Every step of the way, God was with them. He's with us tonight. He's with you tonight. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, God is with you. He cares about you. He loves you. He's reaching for you. The old saying is that life isn't fair. It's not a negative thing to say. It's simply realistic. All of our experiences in life teaches that saying is true. We see the innocent suffer while the wicked prosper. We watch hard work go unnoticed while laziness is rewarded. We often feel as if our situations are unique, that no one else has ever experienced what we are going through. Yet Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 9 and 11, he said, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill. But time and chance happens to them all. The key part of this verse is in that final phrase, to them all. The only fairness in life is that it is unfair to everyone, so no one escapes it injustice. The rich, the poor, the good, and the bad, there is no unfair. There is unfairness for all and all taste life's bitterness. It's ironic that the tragedies that make up the unfairness of life are only part of the story. Loss, thousands of other calamities people deal with, which are made even worse when they are undeserved. That is when they happen to us without rhyme or reason, when they make no sense at all. And the outrage that comes from our suffering only magnifies our pain. But it's at that moment that I've got to trust God. It's at that moment that I've got to trust God. The story of Job is one of life at its best and then life at its worst. Even though he was driven to frustration by his undeserving suffering and the insensitive accusation of his friends, we read words uttered by Job, Naked I came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job said, I go forward, but he's not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. But he knoweth the way that I take. When I have tried, when he has tried me, I shall come forth as go. If you read Job 38 through 42, the Lord talks to Job, and he tells him this. He tells him this twice. He said, brace yourself like a man because I've got some questions for you. Brace yourself like a man because I need to talk to you, and you're going to give me some answers. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Where does light come from, and where does darkness go? Can you take it to your home? Do you know how to get it there? But of course you know all this. There's a little sarcasm there if you didn't know it. 
the Lord has a little sarcasm in him. He said, but of course you know all this. For you were born before it was all created and you are so very experienced. Does the rain have a father? Who gives birth to the dew? Who is the mother of the ice? Who gives birth to the frost from heavens? For the water turns the ice as hard as rock and the surface of the water freezes. And Job replied for the Terrence. He said, I only have heard about you before. But now I've seen you with mine own eyes. And I take back everything I said, and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. Lord, I found it to be true. I found that you are faithful. I found that you are who you said you are. When you read the end of Job, the Bible said he had lost everything. Brother Blake, he had lost all of it. His, his children were gone. His animals he was the greatest man in all the East, the Bible says. He had everything that he needed. But he got seven more sons and three more daughters. And the Bible says there was none as fair as Job's daughters. All his animals and everything that he had was double at the end. But he stayed true to God. I never want to, I never want to go through just a slight amount of what Job went through. I think I've got it bad sometimes. But you stop and think about his story. Stop and think about his story. But God was faithful to him. He's the one that said, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him. I believe through all of that, that Job, that God had faith in Job. We talk about having faith in God. I believe God had faith in Job. That he put him out there and said, have you considered my servant Job? I listened to a message preached by Dr. Gerald Jeffries at Brother Terry Black's church in Memphis. And he preached a message about disappointment and he used Ecclesiastes Three and six at his folk, as his focal point. It says it's a time to get, it is a time to lose, and a time to keep, and a time to cast away. It's not something that we want to hear about, but there are going to be times in our life when we're going to lose. Life will bring us troubles and trials. We've experienced sadness and the taste of disappointment, and it's at these times we ask why. Why, Lord? Why we as Christians are allowed to go through these times in our life? Why did God allow Job to suffer the pain in his life? I believe that God had the utmost faith through Job and his own faith that he would be able to stand and come out stronger than before. The blessings of our trials and tests are determined by how we handle the pressures and the disappointments. That is what is going to determine our character. It's what is going to make me after the fact. It's going to make me the Christian that I am or the man of God that I am or the a woman of God that you are. It's going to build character in me. It's only going to come through our dependence on God. Isaiah 48 and 10 says, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver, and I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. The furnace has fire in it, and God said, I've chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. To afflict means to grieve. It means to distress. It means disappointments and trials and tribulations in life. But it's during these times of our life that God is proving us God forges his character into us by fire to be able to unleash his power into our lives. Psalm 62, 5 and 8, in the Amplified Version, it says, For God alone my soul waits in silence and quietly submits to him, for my hope is from him. He is my only rock and my salvation, my fortress and my defense. I will not be shaken or discouraged. O oh God, my salvation and my glory rest. He is the rock, my unyielding strength and my refuge. Is in God. Trust confidently in Him at all times, O people, and pour out your heart before Him, for God is a refuge for us. I want to let someone know I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready to close. I'm talking about our faith. I'm, be, I'm talking about us being able to see what God has in store for us, what He's doing in our lives. It may not seem, it might not seem so good right now, but the end will always be greater than the beginning. I need to let someone know you're chosen. You're a chosen generation. You're accepted. He's accepted you before the foundation of the world. You are forgiven. You have a purpose. You are sealed and you are united together. Danny Gokey sings a song and it says, Tell your heart to beat again. And it says you're shattered like you've never been before. The life you knew in a thousand pieces on the floor. And the words fall short. 
in times like these, when the world drives you to your knees, you think you're never going to get back to the you that used to be. It says, tell your heart to beat again. Tell your heart to beat again. Close your eyes and breathe. Let the shadows fall away and step into the light of grace. Yesterday's just the closing door and you don't live there anymore. Stand with me tonight. I'm so thankful for what God's doing in our church. I'm so thankful for what God's doing in my life. I want to, I want to encourage someone tonight. Let your faith grow. I talk about faith a lot, but that's all I have in my walk with God is my faith in Him. It's my faith in Him. He's been so good to me. He's been so faithful to me. And whatever you're going through right now, trust God. Put your faith in God. Believe in Him. He'll take, he'll take, care, he'll take care of you. I think the pastor will be back Sunday morning. We have elements class at 10 o'clock. We have service at 11 o'clock, worship service. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. That's Sister Terry's uh, daughter-in-law. Remember her? Her name's Carmeline. It's her mother that's in the hospital. Uh, got anything else? Just raise your hand. God knows. We've already taken prayer. Uh, but God knows what we're going through and what we're dealing with. Brother Terrence dismisses some prayer tonight, brother.